What is the explicit way of writing this second line? Psi prime of x prime is s of lambda psi of x. Notice that s depends on only on the lambda, but not, not on the axis. Otherwise, the transformation would not, would not be a linear one. These are the lambda itself depends on, on the pro property parameters of the transformation. If it is a pure rotation, it only depends on the angles involved. If it is a boost only, it depends only on the boost parameter, but not on the axis. Lambda is independent of the x or x prime. Otherwise, it won't be a linear transformation, as I said. Physics involves only linear transformations. Therefore, this is independent of the axis, and so is the same, s. s only depends on the lambdas, indirectly on the parameters, like the rotation angles and boost parameters. If I was relating the primed spinor to the unprimed one, that would be S inverse of lambda. Right? How, in what different manner I can think of this S inverse of lambda? I can think of the following. If this is the lambda inverse, obviously if you go from x to x prime by the lambda, you go from x prime to x by the inverse of that transformation. If you look at it on the upper levels, that is lambda is taking you from the unprimed to primed, so is the s taking you from unprimed to primed, and this lambda inverse taking the vice versa from prime to unprimed, and s inverse is doing that. How do I look at this S inverse? I can think of S inverse as the direct S associated with the lambda inverse, right? So S, this is an important property which we are going to use intensively in the proof of the demonstration. Think of it again, Jim. <laughs> Instead of going from that side, to the, from the left to the right, say, call it in short, through the lambda, and obviously right to left with the lambda inverse. S is the one which implements this type of this transformation or that transformation in the spinor space. Either I look at the inverse of it as the directly S inverse as direct inverse of this, or the S associated with the inverse lambda. Okay, which enabled me to write this equality. Which sounds trivial, but not a trivial one. Once that particular property is understood, then we can go ahead and see how do I use those transformations to go from the unprimed to primed or primed to unprimed. Okay, let's go from unprimed to primed. I h bar d psi gamma mu d d x mu minus m c psi of x here there was psi of x okay I start with this and go to the prime one so instead of psi I what do I write I write s inverse psi prime of If you look at this as the inverse of that transformation, it was originally we, I had the psi of x there and I moved this as the inverse here and thus it became the psi prime of x prime. S's are independent of the axis. They are constant parameters only involving rotations and boosts. Therefore, if you look at this now, the first term, although it, it's a bit pedantic that what I'm doing now, let's do it pedantically. So what do I have? I h bar gamma mu d dx mu s inverse times psi prime of x prime is the first term that you have. The second term is mc s inverse psi prime of x prime is equal to zero. 
right? That's sort of the composed form of the equation above. I, w I wanted to show you how this thing needs to be handled. These portions are okay. This is independent of the x. I can move it all the way to the left if I want. But here, there's a gamma, a matrix, an S, which is a matrix. The orders here are important. I cannot freely move them in and or out. And also here, there is something which is to be completed yet. This is the derivative with respect to x, whereas here, it involves x prime. So I have to convert the derivative into a derivative involving the x prime rather than the x. How do I do that? We do it in the following manner. Remember, what is this explicit form of that transformation? That Lorentz transformation is x prime mu is lambda mu nu x nu, the usual convention of summation. So I'm not putting in summation signs. And the repeated contracted indices should be up and down. They, they shouldn't be on the same level because of the indefiniteness of the metric. Therefore, one should be up, one should be down. Okay. So, look at that derivative. I have to find a way of converting into a derivative involving x prime. So, I have to use the chain differentiation rule, right? Let's keep this in mind. I will do something on it depending on the need. But let me first make that need arises d by dx mu is, first of all, I need a derivative involving the x prime. The chain then tells you that the x prime nu divided by dx mu, again repeated indices are summed over and they are on the same position. You have to be careful about the position, up and up. So I need this Jacobian. As you know, these are the Jacobians. And can I construct the Jacobian from that Lorentz transformation? Yes, let's go to the infinitesimal form. Take the d's of this. As lambdas do not depend on the x's, obviously, if it is valid for the finite coordinates, it should be valid for the infinitesimals then I can take the ratio to get the Jacobian. That's what I need, right? Let's find the Jacobian from here. dx prime mu dx nu is lambda mu nu. Pay attention to the ordering of the indices. Prime mu up, unprimed nu down, that's mu nu. Pay attention to the also position of the indices. They are not on top of each other. One is left, one is right, because you are going to take the transpose eventually. Shall I just write this here? No, right, Kami, because one is mu nu, this is nu mu, so I have to really change the position of the indices. So this is lambda nu mu. When it's nu mu, this was mu nu, so obviously that's the new mu. Okay, so we have found a beautiful relationship really, it transforming the derivatives. That is here. Perhaps I will write it here. So lambda new mu d dx prime new. I hope you see the prime. That's Okay, so let me substitute this here, so that everything is legitimate now. Indeed, I have the primed derivatives. So what is the new form of the equation? I h bar gamma mu lambda nu mu d dx prime nu s inverse psi prime. Now let me again move, as I am done explicitly to make you comfortable, I can move the psi prime all the way out. MC S inverse psi prime 
of x prime is equal to 0. That's the form of the equation now. Correct? I, I haven't done anything. I, then I said, let me move this out. Keep that or this new form in here. There's an S, S inverse in here, obviously. And if I would like to factor this out, how do I do that? I insert here an identity. We always insert identity whenever we are in trouble, do you know? Notice that there's an S inverse in here, and there's an S inverse in here, that's a constant. So I can factor S inverse to the left. What is left over once I do that? I h bar s gamma mu s inverse. Now, let's see whether anyone will start screaming. Why do you change the order of something? Stuff like that. Notice that here, it is S times gamma mu times lambda, capital lambda, nu mu, d, dx prime mu, etc. All of a sudden, I have jumped over this and put it in here. Question, is this a legitimate th thing that I'm allowed to do so? Or am I, have I done something wrong? Because when it is moved in here, obviously, that's what I have done. I jumped over. Well, obviously, it's legitimate. It's trivially simple. Why? First of all, it doesn't depend on the axis. It depends only on the parameters of the Lorentz transformation, angles or boost parameters. Therefore, it easily jumps over the derivative. How about that? Well, that is a collection of numbers, components of tensors. This is a matrix in the spinor space. Matrix of the spinner space jumps over the numbers easily. Jumps over the derivative and jumps over the numbers. Notice now, S is the matrix in the spinner space. Lambda mu nu's are collection of numbers, components of the tensor in the space time. This is not a matrix in here. This is, this is the matrix. These are not matrices, collection of numbers, components of the Lorentz tensor. Okay. Very nice. Focus on this term. S is yet undetermined. I am trying to determine what S's are. Therefore, the S's should be determined in such a way that this combination is equal to gamma nu. If I want covariance, isn't that so? I started with the un unprimed equation. I am moving, trying to move to primed equation. That is the equation in the k prime frame. If this entire block is equal to gamma nu, so that the equation becomes this is an arbitrary factor, gone, i h bar gamma nu d dx nu m c psi of prime menu, I have difficulty in putting them on time, please don't get confused about that notation. Isn't that nice? Because the starting point was the unprimed equation. And I have gone to the, this was the starting point, this was really psi of x. I have started from this equation, reached to that equation. That's all, non-zero. Arbitrary, I cancelled it. That's an overall factor, right? Then you multiply everything with S again to kill that, it's gone. Nice. 
Well, provided that I know how to solve this equation. <laughs> you see, that's the requirement. That's the requirement of covariance. So what is the equation I obtain? S gamma mu S inverse times lambda nu mu is equal to gamma nu. Are the indices correct? When you are doing such a computation, the first thing you have to check is that you are all the indices are consistent. That is, only there are one set of repeated indices and the free index appears in both sides. Now this time mu and mu are the summed over index. Mu is the free index, indeed it appears in there. So everything is fine. <coughs> okay. Now obviously I need a little bit of Lorentz transformation algebra because either I can keep it as it is in there or I can convert it into a slightly more aesthetic form. Aesthetic form. Let me see what that aesthetic form is. Okay. What is this? I have demonstrated that this is also S lambda inverse. Okay, so my equation is S of lambda gamma mu, S of lambda inverse times lambda nu mu is equal to gamma nu. I have to solve this equation for any type of Lorentz transformation. Therefore, I need really a little bit of Lorentz transformation algebra. It is the time that I have postponed it now. Okay. So, what is the starting point of the Lorentz transformations? We said the invariant is ds squared g mu nu dx mu and dx nu. We, we have written that for the finite length of a vector. Now I'm using the infinitesimal one, which is obviously the same. So if it is an invariant thing, then I should have this to be the same in both frames. Okay, whether I write it in the primed or unprimed frame, I should have the same result. And what I have to do next is just go back to the definition of my Lorentz transformations, finite or infinitesimal, and the, write the right hand side as in terms of the unprimed ones. These are, this is lambda mu rho dx rho and this one is lambda nu sigma dx sigma then I have g mu nu lambda mu rho lambda nu sigma times dx rho dx sigma so I have written the equality of these infinitesimal invariants in unprimed and primed frame and then I have written the primed frame expression in terms of the unprimed frame one in order this is to be the same as the unprimed one this must be equal to what? G rho sigma. Good. So if this is the case then I have one set of relationship between the <coughs> components of the lambda, which is just that equality g rho mu rho sigma g rho sigma is g mu nu lambda mu rho lambda nu sigma is the relation that I have between the components of the Lorentz transformation capital lambda 
So if you can in principle solve this tensor equation, g minus is symmetric 4 by 4. So there are how many relations that you can deduce from this? In principle 4 by 4 16, but 16 is over counting because g minus is symmetric. So there are four diagonals and the three four diagonal, three of diagonal. One, two, three, six, ten. Okay. So altogether, really ten relations which enables you to determine all the components of the lambda. Now perhaps you can use this relationship to demonstrate some of the properties of the elum. Let's take this as the starting point. Let's try to deduce as many properties as possible for the lambda. Let me write the lambda infinitesimal. Say lambda mu nu. If I write this in the infinitesimal case, what do I have? In the infinitesimal case, it should deviate from 1 by a small amount, which is really involving the infinitesimal parameters of the transformations in question. So it is the i, the identity, which is delta mu nu, plus delta omega, using the book's notation. Inf means infinitesimal, and it's an identity plus an infinitesimal amount, right? So that's the reason why I put the delta on it. Let's demonstrate that this uh, uh, term, additional term, is anti-symmetric in the Lorentz indices by substituting this up in the defining relationship. That really is the defining relationship, right? So let's see how do I uh, use it. I take this or its equivalent and substitute it up, it up in the original equation here. So g rho sigma is g mu nu times delta mu rho plus delta omega mu rho, the first vector using that expansion, times Delta nu sigma plus delta omega nu sigma. I haven't done anything. I'm just using the infinitesimal expansion of the Lorentz transformation. So, the first term is what? G mu nu delta mu rho delta nu sigma. So it is really G, G rho sigma, right? It tells you that mu is to, is to be equated to the rho, that's the definition of the, the, the Kronecker delta, right? And this presence of this is telling you that sigma nu should be equal to the sigma, so it becomes in this. One of the indices is set by the first factor, the other is set by the second factor. So leading term is g rho sigma. And I have the cross terms, let me write the cross terms carefully. G mu nu delta nu sigma delta this one mu rho plus g mu nu delta mu rho delta omega nu sigma plus quadratic terms We are doing infinitesimal calculus, right? In the infinitesimal calculus, we retain only the first order terms. Second order terms that is coming this times that times that is the last term which we drop. That cancels that and this cross term should be equal to zero. Let's see whether it's indeed the anti-symmetry relationship that I was looking for.
nu is to be sigma, so g mu, g mu sigma times delta omega mu rho plus mu is rho, g rho nu delta omega rho sigma is equal to zero. So that's what I get. Using now the raising and lowering properties of the G, I have what? This one is delta omega sigma rho, and this one is delta omega rho sigma. Isn't this beautiful that I have proven that? This delta omega, the second part, is anti-symmetric. Sigma rho plus rho sigma is equal to zero. Indeed. This is anti-symmetric. Now let me introduce a notation to finish that eventually I will play with the Lorentz transformations in detail but let me go and finish with that because that's my major, the primary purpose. Let me write this delta omega mu nu as delta omega, the parameter directly, angle or the boost, times a matrix, sort of a unit type of matrix. I'm defining this little lambda. For obvious reason, if it is the capital lambda, then it is good that I define a parameter times a lambda, sort of a, uni, a unit type, unit, not unit of course, the unity is here is strange. So that the infinitesimal form of this is inf is delta mu nu plus delta omega, it's much more comfortable because I can treat this as a single parameter, angle or boost parameter, everything. And there is a tensor now which is anti-symmetric. That is lambda mu nu is equal to minus lambda nu mu. After factoring the parameter itself. So let's use this to solve that relationship. By the way, per, per, I, I have to carry out one more step, perhaps, before attempting to solve it. Focus on this. If I focus on that, or perhaps I should focus on that, I should focus on something else. Okay. I want to get rid of this lambda as for aesthetic purposes. I want to get rid of this lambda from here. This is collection of numbers, right? These are the matrices. And that is just coefficients, components of the Lorentz transformation, which is a space-time tensor. Let's remember uh, the sorry the matrix and its inverse matrix is defined in this manner, right? You multiply with the inverse, now you get the identity. Let me write this in the tensor form: lambda mu rho, lambda inverse. Rho sigma is delta mu sigma. Perhaps I should put this new in here so that I can have that relationship. That's the definition of inverse. So how do I make use of it here? Let me write that equation underneath. And let's see whether I can utilize that, this identity. S 
Yama Mu S inverse for the time being, short, either S inverse or S of lambda inverse. It's totally up to me to write whichever form I like. Lambda nu mu is equal to gamma nu. Notice that the free index is what? The free index is nu. So I have to, I cannot touch on the mu's. I can only uh, look at the free index in here. So in order to utilize that relation, what do I have to use? I have to do the following. Multiply this from right or left, doesn't matter, because these are just sets of numbers, right? By uh, S lambda inverse rho. Mu is free that I cannot touch upon. Uh, rho nu. Or rho nu. Rho nu, sorry. Let me see whether this would, would do the job for me. I haven't done anything. I have just taken that equation that we have obtained from the covariance requirement and written it and then multiply it from right or left doesn't matter. These are a set of numbers. The matrix are, these are matrices and these are numbers and I am just paying attention on the location of indices. Notice that what does this give to me? Let's check. What is it? Lambda nu mu lambda inverse rho nu, or you can put this to the left because these are not matrices, just a collection of things. So lambda inverse rho nu, lambda nu mu, perhaps this is more comfortable for you to visualize, although you are free to manipulate them any way you like. So what is this? This is just check against the relationship there. So it is delta rho mu, correct? Lambda inverse times lambda, that is the a matrix times this inverse matrix is the identity. So the left hand side is what? The left hand side is S gamma mu S inverse times delta rho mu, and right hand side is lambda inverse rho nu gamma nu. What is this? This is the Kronecker delta in four dimension, changing the mu to rho. So S gamma rho, rho S inverse is lambda inverse rho nu gamma nu. That's nice because it moved that coefficients to the right hand side and it has left the left hand side free, S gamma S inverse. If I replace lambdas with the lambda inverses, I want to rewrite that. If it is true for lambdas, it should be true for lambda inverses. So the left hand side is S lambda inverse gamma rho. S inverse of lambda inverse is equal to lambda rho nu gamma nu. What is this? This is S lambda inverse, which you, if you want, you can even write it as S inverse, but this one is S lambda. Okay. And right hand side became that. Now, go back to the usual convention, change the row to mu, and then the, the it becomes that S inverse gamma mu, S is equal to lambda mu nu gamma nu. This last exercise in five minutes is carried out only for aesthetic purposes. You are free to use any equation you like. That equation or this equation or anything, provided that you do everything consistently. 
Okay. The next step is, I will try to solve this now. I will try to, so let's try to solve this equation to determine the S's. Usually when you have matrix equations, to solve it, you have to go to the infinitesimal case. By the way, perhaps I, should, I forgot to mention one thing. Let me here to justify this approach that I am free to go to the infinitesimal case and let me prove one thing. What is that one thing? What is the defining relationship of the <coughs> defining relationship of the Lorentz transformation? G mu nu is equal to G G rho sigma G mu nu lambda mu rho lambda nu sigma. That's really the definition, very definition of the Lorentz transformation, because that translates the physical invariant, infinitesimal invariant into mathematical language that's based on the invariance of the interval. I can write this in the following form. G this is a diagonal matrix, right? One minus one minus one minus one. Let me call it G. Well, first, first of all, I, let me carry out some manipulations before doing that. <laughs> the rightmost factor is lambda nu sigma. Let me put G mu nu next here so that neighboring indices are contracted, indeed correct. And, but this factor is what? Lambda mu rho. I will convert this into lambda transpose rho mu. Now check the ordering of the indices. Rho is the free index, sigma is the free index, rho is down, sigma is down. Indeed, rho is down, sigma is down. One is to the left, one is to the right. So three indices are there. Mu's are up, down, nu's down, up. They are contracted, summed over. So all the indices are in the correct order if I write it in this fashion. So now I say, let me define the matrices in the following manner. I will do it cleanly in the right side. Now, let me introduce the matrices. Lambda, mu, nu. I will define. Notice that when you are using ordinary matrices, four by four, the relationship between those four by four matrices and the tensors should be defined in a clear way. This one is that. Transpose mu nu. If you want, what was the original form of this? The original form, well anyway, this is correct. When it's the transpose, it is the first index is down, second index is up. When it's the matrix, Ordinary straight matrix, the first index is up, second index is down. But G mu nu is G, so is, if you want, this is G. You may say, what, all of a sudden? Well, G squared is one. This is a, because one minus one minus one minus one. This is the, these are fab, bad, based on the fact that, no, rho, rho, rho nu is delta mu nu. In matrix notation, this means G squared is one. 
or G inverse is G. Okay, these are beautiful sets of relations for the matrices. Right hand sides are matri matrices, so left hand sides are the tensors, and these are the correspondences between the tensors and the matrices. So how do I write that uh, defining relationship? I write it then nicely as G is equal to lambda transpose G lambda. Isn't that beautiful? It looks very much like the ordinary rotation group's defining relationship compared. This was what defines the orthogonal matrices, right? Which are the rotations in three-dimensional space. R transpose times R is equal to identity in three, in three dimensions. 3D. D. 3D. It's generalization. So Lorentz transformations could be understood as the generalizations of these three-dimensional ordinary rotation group matrices. My purpose now is to check the following. Let's take the determinant of both sides. Take the determinant. Okay, so it's the last thing I'm going to do now. Take determinant. Determinant of G is equal to determinant of lambda transpose times determinant of G times determinant of lambda. Determinant of G goes away from both sides and you have determinant of lambda transpose, which is the same as you know from the basic algebra. The, the determinant of a transpose is the same as the determinant of itself. So one, number one now, not the identity matrix. Determinant lambda squared. So determinant of lambda is plus or minus one. Nice. That tells you that the Lorentz transformations, which is based on the invariance of the interval, gives you two classes of transformations. One of them are called the proper ones, corresponding to the determinant plus one, and the others are called the improper ones, corresponding to determinant lambda minus one. For the proper ones, you can start with the infinitesimals and consider a succession of infinitesimal transformations to get a finite one, in mathematician's terminology, this is called the integration of the infinitesimal. You can do it for the proper ones only. For the improper ones, you cannot construct them by a succession of infinitesimal transformations. Improper ones. Which, what are the improper ones? Space inversion. Don't touch the time. Reverse all the space coordinates to minus one. Parity. Or time inversion, don't touch the space, but invert the time, time reversal. They are improper, and they cannot be obtained by a succession of infinitesimal transformations. They have to be single, single shot, finite transformations. Next, they are considering the ordinary space-time transformation. They are the proper class, that is, they are the determinant one class, determinant plus one class. So I can consider an infinitesimal transformation and integrate the infinitesimal one to get a finite. And that's what I will do next to solve this. Lambda proper, that is determinant lambda is plus one. For this class, I am going to solve this. So it's a good point again to give another short break.